Good. So as the title suggests, um, oxygen deprivation mass. Have you guys heard of this? Um, probably. You probably have. I've, I've, seen, I've seen people in the gym working out with these masks on their face. Um, and the purpose was to, what they believe, replicate high altitude training. Do you have you guys ever heard of you know in the past I don't know if they still do it. I've actually remember seeing like uh, MTV Cribs. I want to say it was Terrell Owens maybe. He had like a tank where it replicated high altitude training. And it was under the belief and I'm going to explain why that's incorrect. Under the belief that you know, training in high altitudes improved your cardiovascular system, your endurance, your performance. I'm not sure if people still do it, but I'm going to explain why it's absolute utter nonsense. And that's where these um, oxygen deprivation masks came from. You may have seen people. You know, I'll br I'll try to I'll try to bring some up here. Um, let's see imaging. <laughs> It's just crazy, 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 silly, crazy, silly. Let's see, window capture. Uh, yeah, there we go. So these things. <laughs> so under the impression, you know, that restricting the amount of oxygen or making it harder to breathe somehow improves your cardiovascular system. So people wear these in the gym. Somebody was asking me about them. I'm going to debunk them. It kind of sounds like a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff I do is debunking stuff. And you know, I'm not like an exercise debunker. What I am is an exercise educator. And with that comes debunking a lot of nonsense so you know what we're going to debunk right now is is going to be these oxygen deprivation masks so here's the belief the belief comes around high altitude training the belief that if you train in high altitudes it somehow I, I think this is what people believe it somehow makes your blood more oxygen rich or something and it improves your cardiovascular fitness blah 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 well guess what that's not true. Okay, so this has to do with something called the Bohr effect. Okay, the Bohr effect. What happens is um, a change in hemoglobin. So hemoglobin carries oxygen. Okay, it attaches to oxygen through your bloodstream and delivers it to working tissues, organs, whatever. So when you go to a high altitude environment that has lower oxygen in the air what happens is something called the Bohr effect there's an adaptation where hemoglobin reduces its affinity or its ability to or I guess it's in layman's terms its stubbornness for releasing or getting or detaching from oxygen so when you Go to a high altitude environment, the hemoglobin is has a higher affinity for oxygen. It attaches to oxygen um, stronger. And this, since there's less oxygen, the tissues suffer. The, the tissues, the hemoglobin is not giving up its oxygen to the tissues in an environment where there's less oxygen. So the adaptation is after a couple of days of being in higher altitude, hemoglobin's affinity or ability to bind to oxygen and hang on to it reduces. So this allows hemoglobin to give the oxygen to the working tissues more easily since there's less oxygen. This is an adaptation that happens when you're in a high altitude environment. And it only adapts when you're in the high altitude environment, okay? When you go back to 
a normal altitude, hemoglob hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen increases again. So people are under the impression that if you train in high altitudes or you try to replicate high altitude training, that it's improving your cardiovascular system because when they go into a high altitude, they notice that they any sort of physical ex exertion results in labored breathing. So they think their cardiovascular system improves and then they carry that improvement back down to regular altitude. It's wrong because it has to do with the adaptations and hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So the adaptation will occur, hemoglobin will, become, will reduce its affinity for oxygen in a high elevation, and then improve its affinity for oxygen again when you go back to normal elevation. You cannot carry that adaptation with you. Now, working out with a silly oxygen deprivation mask doesn't even produce this adaptation. The adaptation comes from less oxygen over a period of, you know, a couple of days, okay? Your body's not going to produce this bore effect adaptation in an hour in the gym, okay? So that's one reason this is complete nonsense. And then the second reason is, of course, you don't carry that adaptation with you. So when athletes are training in high altitudes, and they improve when they go back to that low altitude they're gonna to have to improve again so they think that you know they're gonna train for and I remember Olympic athletes doing this they train in high altitude <laughs> thinking that they're gonna get better training because the first couple of days breathing in a high altitude is tough until your body adapts with hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen and then they think that then when they go to perform back at the low altitude or, or lower altitude that they're somehow going to be better but the thing is first of all it takes a couple days for this adaptation to take place and then it takes a couple days to take place again once you reach normal altitude this mask is not going to do that it's not going to do that because yes it's you know technically making your breathing more labored but it isn't going to create the environment which causes the adaptation to occur and even if it did you would literally have to keep this mask on for several days, not only in the gym. So just because something makes it harder to breathe does not mean it is going to have a more profound um, improvement in your cardiovascular system. That's ridiculous. So this is probably the biggest, one of the biggest scams ever in the fitness industry is this stupid mask. You don't want to make it harder for you to breathe when you're training. You want to make it as easy as possible for you to breathe, okay? You know, think about it. If that mask was effective, why wouldn't you just hold your breath throughout an entire exercise? You know, simply creating more labored breathing has nothing to do with the adaptations that occur and make your cardiovascular system more efficient and therefore make it easier to do things that don't require a lot of effort. So a lot of people, you know, what happens is they say, you know, my cardio is bad because they're doing a, a pretty easy activity and they're noticing it's kind of difficult and they're breathing heavy. Well, the breathing heavy is a side effect of or, you know, a side effect or a um, re well, I'll just say side effect. This, the, the labored breathing is a side effect of poor cardiovascular and metabolic efficiency. But a lot of this, again, occurs in the metabolism at the muscle cell. There are also some adaptations that occur as a result of high amounts of venous return and stroke volume. Um, that occur, you know, in the, uh, um, you know, I was just reading a Kevin Hutchins book, things about cardiac perfusion that, that occur, but most of it's happening in the actual muscle. So holding your breath or restricting your breathing is not going to produce the adaptations in the muscle cell. These adaptations in the muscle cell occur as a result of 
not the labored breathing, but the intense muscular effort. Now, when I place a huge demand on my muscle, they're going to re require more oxygen. That is why I'm going to breathe more in order to be able to deliver more oxygen to the muscle in order to carry out aerobic respiration. So the labored breathing is just a side effect. It's a side effect of working your muscles hard. It's not the labored breathing that is making the adaptations. It's the muscular effort. So anything you're doing in the gym to make your breathing more difficult has nothing to do with improving your cardiovascular system. All right, so these, these oxygen deprivation mass, high altitude training, it's nonsense, all right? Um, so it's called the Bohr effect. Um, these things are trying to replicate the Bohr effect. They don't do it. And, um, you know, again, you know, if you're, the way you want to breathe during exercise. And another thing about like, you know, one of my clients is a personal trainer and he was talking about some idiot chiropractor, witch doctor. Keep in mind, most chiropractors just, they're witch doctors. You know, there's, there's literally zero evidence behind chiropractic, anything being effective. Okay. Um, they're freaking witch doctors. But, um, The way we breathe during exercise should be quite simple. It should be relaxed. It should, you should be breathe, the way I heard it described as the best is you should breathe openly and breathe freely, relaxed, okay? This chiropractor was talking about, you know, don't breathe with your mouth and breathe with your belly more, or breathe with your chest more. You know, the truth is, no matter how you breathe, your diaphragm works the same. Now, if you sit there and you try to breathe with your stomach or breathe with your chest, <coughs> or although there might be a slightly different feeling, there's no difference in how the diaphragm is working. Okay, So you'll have some silly... Um, trainers or in this case a chiropractor recommend different types of breathing for exercise ignore it bullshit and um, you just want to breathe openly and freely you shouldn't really be even spending that much time thinking about breathing during training you should simply the think about it this way when you're breathing while you're jogging how are you breathing you're not even thinking about your breathing while you're jogging are you you're just Inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. Okay. <clears throat> so why are we breathe, thinking about how we breathe during exercise? You should be breathing like that. You should be breathing, you know, openly, freely, and continuously like you're jogging. I'm doing a repetition. <sighs> not holding my breath. I'm not expiring with force. <sighs> I'm not doing Valsalva maneuver. You should be breathing openly, continually, because your muscles need oxygen to produce energy. It's called aerobic respiration. The mitochondria and the process of the Krebs cycle is using oxygen in order to produce ATP for your muscles to contract. So if you are somehow reducing the amount of oxygen this aerobic cycle is getting, the citric acid cycle, Krebs cycle, whatever the hell you want to call it, you're restricting how well that metabolism can operate and how much energy they're going to provide to your muscles. So if you're somehow restricting your breathing during training, you're going to restrict your performance. You're going to restrict how hard you can train, how hard you can put your muscles because your muscles need the oxygen to produce ATP and to produce contractions. Make sense? So all the silly breathing, you know, to wrap it up, anything that is going to make it harder to breathe during exercise is absolute utter nonsense. 
high altitude training is nonsense because people don't understand the Bohr effect and how hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen changes as a temporary adaptation to altitude and changes in the amount of oxygen. Okay, it cannot be carried with you. Um, so, so anything labored, blah, 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 blah. And um, oxygen deprivation masks are ridiculous. Can you believe people are, are able to make money off of such stupid shit? Like, you know, it's, it's like, I wonder if the people who invent these things, not that, um, b -b 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 where is it? I wonder if people, people who invent these things, like, think, where am I? Right there. There we go. I wonder if they think it works or if they're just kind of like, I mean, what's different? What's the difference between that and this? <laughs> None of you guys wanted to work out with masks on during you know what. But you want to go spend 40 bucks on this? Peak resistance high altitude training mask. See? It's so silly. Like, they, you know, it's, it's just the bore effect. I mean, you can't. Look at this. How much are these things? 50 bucks. <laughs> you might as well light 50 bucks on fire. You'd have more fun with it. Unbelievable. Anyway, just wanted to debunk that myth for you guys. All this oxygen deprivation, high altitude training. There's no such thing as high altitude training. It just doesn't exist. Okay. So, I'm going to do Q&A for the next 15 minutes or so. Do a quick one today. If you haven't tried Golden Arrow System, I added hours of new videos. You can see Golden Arrow System Plus right there. I call it Golden Arrow System Plus now because I added a bunch of videos that go, they're about 20 to 40 minute videos that go in depth on you know, exercise physiology, nutrition, biomechanics, that kind of stuff, program design. So the Golden Arrow System has been upgraded. If you already got the Golden Arrow System, it's already been upgraded. Look for um, the section called New Videos. I've got more videos to upload in Golden Arrow Plus. I'm just releasing them slowly. I've already got them. They're all recorded. They're ready to go. So if you guys want a way to really improve your cardiovascular system, the next couple of weeks I'm going to be talking a lot about cardio because people don't understand it. If you want to improve your cardiovascular system way more effectively, do the Golden Arrow System high intensity training. Way more effective than jogging, way more effective than swimming, more effective than all that shit. The reason comes down to, you know, more venous return, improvement in stroke volumes and adaptations that cardio doesn't give you. We'll go into that some other day. Anyway, so if you guys got questions, go ahead. I'm going to be doing a lot more live streams lately since I got my little studio set up. All right, let me see here. All right, question, blah, 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 blah. Can static hold strength be measured of progress as there is no skill involved that should be measured? Yeah, actually, believe it or not, so well-performed um, exercise studies use what's called um, isometric peak force as a measure of strength. So they'll take an individual at the beginning of the study, they'll have them push against something statically and see how much force their muscle can produce statically then at the end of the study try it again if they're able to produce more force statically they've gotten stronger it's actually more accurate measurement of strength is um, isometric or peak force or static or isometric peak force output so um it is probably the most accurate way to one not the most but one of the more accurate ways to measure strength because there is no skill involved. There is no repetition. Um, the thing is, it's tough to measure strength with exercises because there are things like levers, you know, how long your limbs are. People with shorter limbs um, are going to generally be able to move more weight because the amount of uh, work and leverage. Um, different muscle insertions, you know, for instance, if my bicep my biceps inserts further away from my elbow, I'm going to be able to curl more weight compared to an individual whose biceps 
um, attaches closer to their elbow. They're not going to be able to curl as much as weight. And these things could play a role with things like squatting and benching and all those other exercises too. So someone can demonstrate strength by being able to move a lot of weight, but that's only, you know, that's only one aspect of it. There's a bunch of other aspects to it. And if you guys could, please hit the like button. I mean, I, you know, sit here and coach you guys for absolutely nothing. <laughs> At least you could do is hit the like button. You know, I spend my time reading all this nonsense and then teaching it to you guys. Just hit the like button. All right, let's see. What about CBD oil after workouts? Any thoughts in terms of anti-inflammatory properties? That's fucking hoopla. <laughs> anti-inflammatory. Well, here's the thing. It, it, you don't necessarily... So inflammation is a side effect of exercise, of course. But your goal, taking down inflammation or reducing inflammation faster is not going to improve your results or necessarily speed up your recovery. Inflammation is one aspect of recovery. But then there's fatigue. You know, how the muscles can... Um, contract again you know that may be the the muscles the fast twitch motor units may not be able to produce a high amount of force for several days even though your inflammation is down um you know there's there's muscular damage there's micro trauma there's a bunch of different things to recover it's not only inflammation so you, you know you really shouldn't be hyper focused on reducing inflammation post-workout because it's really got nothing to do with anything does cbd reduce inflammation i don't know maybe um my gut feeling tells me it's nonsense to sell bullshit it could work but guess what i mean ibuprofen reduces inflammation an ice bath <laughs> reduces inflammation but the inflammatory thing you know it, it, reducing inflammation faster doesn't mean your muscles grow faster that's only one aspect of recovery is inflammation. But then there's microtrauma, damage, fatigue. Um, basically, fatigue is like your, your muscle's ability to produce force again. It takes some time for that to improve again. <clears throat> but, you know, if you want to take CBD oil, go for it. I just, you know, I kind of think most of this stuff is just kind of placebo. It probably is. Is that an adaptation to living in high altitudes? Well, no, for example, that not so good soccer teams like Bolivia can beat teams in Brazil when paying, playing in La Paz, which is over three kilometers high. Yeah. Um, the, if a better soccer team goes and plays in high altitude and they don't allow enough time for the Bohr effect to take a place, to take place, if they don't allow enough time for that hemoglobin affinity adaptation to occur, then they're going to go get their ass kicked. <laughs> because, you know, you can't like, for instance, uh, say it's Friday and your game is on Sunday. That's probably not going to be enough time for these individuals for the adaptation to take place. And they're going to probably get crushed. Um, I always wonder how they do that in the NFL. Um, you know, people who go play in Denver... Um, I was in Denver about a month ago, and I noticed like the first two days, you know, I went hiking in, on mountains and stuff, and you know, it was, I was kind of labored. It wasn't like anything super noticeable, but again, I'm in shape. But um, I wonder, you know, if you go and play Denver, the Denver Broncos, you know, but the, the same thing's going to happen with them too. Um, you know, it's, uh, well, not as much, but you know, if you go and you play the Denver Broncos and you're at like a lower lower altitude. You're going to need a few days. I wonder if they do that. Um, that could be a huge advantage for Denver. And I always wondered, you know, people who are playing in high altitude, it's if you don't give the opposing team enough time to adapt, it, it's kind of cheating <laughs> because they're already adapted. The high altitude te team is adapted. So if you take a low altitude team, they're going to need time. It's almost like cheating. But I would imagine, the, you know, people who... Um, yeah, when the Bolivians go play against Brazil at sea level, they get destroyed. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's what would happen. I mean, they're probably just not adapted when they go and play the higher altitude team. And it's tough to breathe, and they get, they get beat up. Is hyperextension lower back injury possible? 
on 45 degree body weight back extension. How do you know when to stop at the top of the movement? I was just training, so I have two clients, two in-person clients. By the way, if you're in the Florida area, um, I might take one more client. I, I don't, you know, I don't do too much in-person training anymore, but email me at jvincenttraining.com. If you're in the Florida area and you want me to train you, um, I might take on one more. I've got two. That was my limit, but we'll see. Um, is hyperextension lower back injury possible on your forty? Well, mm, yeah, but it's it's more that you know if you extend too much and you contract too much, you put your lumbar extender muscles, the superficial ones, the ones you can feel, you put them in active insufficiency. They contract so much that they're not able to produce much force. And so, for instance, take take your biceps, flex it like this, and then bring your shoulder behind your head while flexing your biceps as hard as you can. All right, flex your biceps real hard, and then do this. You're gonna feel a cramping sensation in your biceps. This is called active insufficiency, when a muscle contracts so much that its force production goes down. Now, when I'm doing a lumbar extension exercise, if I go back too far, um, you may put those superficial muscles in active insufficiency. You're going to, so the MedX lumbar extension machine was literally designed to do this. Put those superficial muscles you can feel on your lower back, put them in active insufficiency so that way they can't do their job very well, they can't contract very well, and the deeper muscles, the multifidus, is loaded okay and that's how we strengthen the deep muscles of our lower back and eliminate back pain by putting these muscles in active insufficiency um if you're using a lot of momentum or too heavy of a weight it is possible to cause that deep muscle multifidus muscle to spasm if you're doing a back extension like that um but i if you're doing it slowly you're not going to get hurt how do you know when to stop at the top of the movement so the way I instruct uh, my clients is get to the point where you're feeling a, a good contraction and then back off. More extension does not mean better. Go to the point where you feel that tightness, that contraction in your lower back. Contract, hold, and then ease out of it. All right, does that make sense? Is squatting all the way down bad for your knees? Yes. Now we need to remember when you're when you're choosing your approach to training, you also need to consider long term health. Okay, so squatting all the way down, you know, sure it's great for dinner is ready. What the fuck? <laughs> um, squatting all how would she? Whatever. My girlfriend just got on my something and told me dinner was ready. Oh, because the iPad is signed to Okay, whatever. I'm deleting that comment. But apparently dinner's ready. Um, move. Bye. So, um, when, we're, when we're creating an exercise program, we don't only want what's most effective. Because in the long run, everything is equally effective. Everything. You also got to consider safety. So if you come from a powerlifting background or a competitive lifting background or a functional training background, you are going to promote squatting ass to grass all the way down every time because that's just the way you do it. But from a long-term joint health perspective, not a good idea because the way your knee works, and if you want to learn this, Bill De Simone has a book called Moment Arm Exercise. The way your knee works is that when you go way, 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 way down, there's a lot of pulling forces against your patellar tendon. And it's essentially prying, if I'm all the way down, in a, in a deep squatting all the way down, I'm essentially prying my patella off of my knee. It's, it's having a prying effect. And you're pulling your connective tissue on your knee and you're bending it. 
not good, not good. Um, but you know, a lot of the you know competitive lifters, I mean, they're you know they're judged on depth. So it depends if your goal is just overall exercise benefit. Don't go all the way down. If your goal is to compete in squatting or some kind of competitive lift, well, you're going to have to go all the way down because that's how you're scored. So <clears throat> is squatting all the way down bad? Over time, probably, likely. Um, and there's no additional, other than how you're scored in competitive lifting, there's no additional benefit in terms of muscular strength or size going versus going all the way down or simply squatting to about parallel or a little bit below parallel. No difference. The only difference is in how you're scored. All right. According to a college course I'm, I've taken, it takes more effort for the same muscle to move against resistance when the lever is longer. Longer limbs have harder time moving weight. Exactly. Wow. I actually taught it correctly in college. Beautiful. <clears throat> All right. I've seen your videos about free weights versus machines. What's your thoughts on cable? Curious if I could build a cable only routine with the program. Hell yeah, you can. I mean, a, a cable's, you know, when I, I would consider a cable a machine. It is because a pulley is a simple machine, just like an inclined plane. You guys remember maybe an element or you know, middle school or junior high, whatever you guys call it, wherever you're from, you learned about simple machines, like an inclined plane, like a ramp, a wheel, um, you know, like a, like a, a pulley. A pulley is a simple machine. So yes, a pulley is a machine. Um, you can definitely build an entire workout around cables. It's the, the tool you use is not nearly as important as how you use it. All tools, if used correctly, result in the same outcome in the long run, your genetic potential. Whether you use the barbell, the free weight, the, I'm not even gonna say kettlebell, Nautilus machine, matrix machine, whatever. Um, no matter which tool you use, as long as you are using that tool correctly, results are going to be exactly the same. If you are using the cables correctly, they're great. I use a combination of cables, free weights, machines, body weight. I use a combination of everything. Um, so yeah, it's not really, the machine doesn't really make a, a big difference. All right, let's see. All right, Muhammad. It's cool I take it with black seed oil to relax so I can sleep. Hey, it can help you sleep. There, you know, I think there's some, you know, there seems to be um, I, I haven't personally read any evidence behind CBD, but you know, there seems to be a lot of people talking about it. It must help. Um, or is that placebo too? I, you know, I don't know if black seed oil, CBD is helping you sleep. It might, it could. Um, is it placebo? Hey, even if it is placebo, if it's working, it's fucking working. All right. You know, I've read that, um, Medication is 60% placebo, <laughs> all of it. So if it's working, it's working, even if it's placebo. Um, bought your GES because of all the free stuff on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, let's, I like that kind of support. Um, I do. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing more free stuff on YouTube. But if you want to learn the really, really, really in-depth stuff, I have coaching for that. Um, the link's in the description. You click that. In the coaching, we go over, you know, you know, in two to three recorded group calls a week, we go over all the detailed stuff on exercise science, <clears throat> nutrition, research, program design, exercise selection, biomechanics. We go over all that stuff in my coaching program, really in a lot of detail. Um, and then I work with you directly, monitor all your training, make sure you get the best results. So if you're interested in learning like all the details, or if you're interested in just really transforming your physique with my personal guys or guidance, there's a link in the description for that too. All right. How do you fix lower back stiffness? Is it a matter of tight hamstring and lower back muscles? Well, let me ask you this, Nate. Do you sit all day long? Like look at, you know, when you're looking at stiffness, um, 
I wouldn't, I would look more, I would look at that as kind of like a, almost like a repetitive injury. Like something, like for instance, a pitcher get, you know, gets a bad rotator cuff because they throw so much. A lot of people have a lot of issues because they sit so much. So kind of look at what you're doing on a daily basis. Um, if your lower back is stiff, so when I lean forward like this, I'm creating a moment arm and resistance against my lower back muscles. So my lower back muscles have to contract because remember, muscles don't produce movement. They can permit movement, but they also can prevent movement. So when I'm leaning forward, my lower back muscles are contracting to prevent me from falling forward, okay? So if you are sitting, leaning forward a lot throughout the day, and your muscles are constantly contracting, preventing you from, you know, falling forward, could lead to back stiffness. Um, I would imagine that's part of the uh, part of the reason. Okay, if someone's very long femur, is squatting leg press going to be difficult? Yep, 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 yep. People with shorter femurs and longer lower legs, longer longer tibias, generally can squat more weight. People with um, shorter lower legs and longer upper legs have a hard time squatting. And this comes down to the lever against the muscle when you're squatting and leg pressing. If your leg is longer, just like if I hold a weight here, it feels lighter. If I hold the weight out here, it feels heavier. If I have a shorter leg, I'm going to be able to leg press more because it's a shorter lever compared to a longer leg. Black seed oil, interesting. Strengthens the immune system, huh. Interesting, never heard of it. I want to make my friends try hit. Should I just make them do a workout with minimal exercises, one set to failure, and really slow reps, or gradually change it? Well, what I would do is if you want to introduce um, high intensity training to people, you just need to focus on the intensity. Teach them intensity. Teach them or show them how to properly train to failure with high effort. That everything around high intensity training is training with the highest effort possible. The stimulus is motor unit recruitment. Recruiting as many motor units as possible, creating tension in them and stimulating them through mechanotransduction. That's basically it. The harder you push your body, the more motor units are recruited. The more motor units are thereby stimulated via mechanotransduction. That's where the stimulus is, the intensity. So you start by teaching them intensity, teaching them how to train to failure. I would, don't worry about one set. Don't even really worry about the rep cadence. Have them do the cadence relatively slow, controlled. Intensity is everything. Then the rep cadence, the volume, the frequency. High intensity training isn't necessarily just one set, okay? High intensity training is we train the muscles with the highest level of effort impossible, possible in order to recruit the most amount of un motor units and stimulate the most uh, muscle fiber to grow. Okay, that's it. And that's achieved through intensity. Then we adjust the volume and frequency to accommodate that. And generally, when you are training the muscle extremely hard, the volume and frequency must be reduced so much that in many cases, one set is not only that is necessary, it's all that you can tolerate. Okay. Then we employ a slow repetition cadence. So, so that way we reduce peak forces and reduce shearing forces. So that way we do not destroy our joints in the process. But the step one is intensity. Those other two steps, adjusting volume and frequency, slow cadence, they can, you know, you don't need to overwhelm people with that in the beginning. Just teach them how to train hard and teach them how to control the load. Are mobility exercises necessary for joint health? Absolutely not. Joint health, joint health is a result of 
muscular strength. Considering you're not destroying your joints in the process. The stronger your muscles are, the stronger your joints are going to be. When I strengthen a muscle, I strengthen the structural integrity of that joint. I also strengthen the tissues the joint is made of. Um, you know, uh, the connective tissues will strengthen indirectly as a side effect of your muscles becoming stronger. So when I, when I make my muscles stronger, there are signals that are sent throughout my body that tell my ligaments and my tendons and my bones to become thicker, denser, and stronger. So what is essential for joint health is not putting our joints in unsafe ranges of motion and making them and exposing them to injury risk. Just because a, a joint can go in a particular position doesn't mean you should be putting it in that position. <laughs> joint health is best achieved by strengthening your muscles. Connective tissues will get stronger. The stronger your muscle that works with that joint is, the stronger that joint will be. Also, your bones will get stronger. So this mobility stuff for about joint health is just complete folklore nonsense silliness. Mobility is a combination of flexibility and strength. So flexibility is um, a joint's ability to go in some particular range of motion. So that combined with strength equals mobility. So you, if you improve your flexibility or enhance your flexibility, which is indirectly improved through strength training, and you improve your strength, well, if mobility is a combination of flexibility and strength, strength training improves mobility. It's as simple as that. Your flexibility will improve with strength training. There's been research showing that Individuals who strength trained and individuals who did flexibility work, they improved their flexibility the same. Um, we'll go over that in a live stream. So flexibility improves from strength training and strength apparently improves from strength training. And if mobility is a combination of flexibility and strength, well, all we have to do is strength train for improvements in mobility, <laughs> right? It's Quite easy. All right. Um, two more questions. Would a leg extension and leg curl be a better alternative for someone with long femurs versus lower leg? Well, no, because you've got to train your glutes. Um, just because you have a long femur doesn't mean you shouldn't do a leg press or a squat. It just means that the amount of weight you will be able to move in those exercises might be a little lower than somebody with a shorter femur. But it doesn't mean avoid them. What's your thoughts on hill sprints? Um, there's nothing a hill sprint can do that a regular full body strength training, high intensity, golden era system workout can't do. Everything hill sprints do, golden era system training does better. Way better and safer. Unless you were to compete in a hill sprinting competition, there's no reason to do hill sprints at all. <clears throat> all right, Muhammad. In April, I tore, sprained something in my knee playing soccer or football, as we call it in the UK. But doing hit helps repair it pretty rapid. It doesn't feel like I had an injury. Exactly. When you strengthen your muscles, you strengthen your joints. It's as simple as that. And... A lot of my clients in my studios who had knee injuries, shoulder injuries, back injuries, you name it. We eliminated them with just basic high intensity training like the Golden Era system. Eliminated it. It's, it's not that complicated. Uh, if you have joint pain, if you have some kind of joint issue going on, safe strength training within a safe range of motion, an adequate effective range of motion, most of the time will at least help it feel better and in some cases fix it <clears throat> all right one more question 
I don't know why I'm like tripping over my words. I think I'm exhausted. I think that's why. So I'm like, trying to say things. All right. I did dumbbell. See, I can't talk. <laughs> oh my God. I did the bench. Okay. I did dumbbell bench press under hit. I then tried to do low weight lateral raise, but was shaking on the first rep. Is it because all I needed for push access? You were shaking because your muscles are spent. So if you did a dumbbell bench press and then a lateral raise, well, the dumbbell bench press works your deltoids, your medial deltoids, or the lateral head, really hard, really hard. Um, you did low weight lateral raise, but were shaking on the first rep. Um, did you do any other exercises before the lateral raise? Or is the only exercise you did before the lateral raise a bench press? Um, if that's the case, what I would imagine is the reason you were shaking was because you did a bunch of other exercises too. Um, I, I don't, you know, it's unlikely that only the dumbbell bench press, I'm saying barbell, it says dumbbell. Because well, I'm tired and I can't talk. If you do, it's unlikely that a dumbbell bench press exercise, just that, cause you to shake during a, during a lateral raise. Generally, you will start to shake towards the end of your workout, and it's because all of your muscles are weakened. And it's harder for your body to stabilize itself because you're weak. Um, weakened muscle, uh, stabilization is a role a muscle can play. And if... Um, your muscles are weak they're not as good at stabilizing and exercise weakens your muscles temporarily all right dumb username i actually like that new username you're lucky you got that username <coughs> if close grip pull downs work the same muscles as the row why would you do both they involve the same muscles, but a pull down places more emphasis um, on the, or there's more relative involvement of the latissimus muscles. And a horizontal pulling movement, there's more relative involvement of the muscles around the scapula, your rhomboids, um, your trapezius. So they both involve the same num uh, muscles, but a pull down in a row emphasize the relative involvement of different muscles. So a row is going to work your trapezius and your rhomboids better than a pull down. Although a pull down will work them, a row will work them better. All right, one more. I have an O2 trainer, but I don't know if I can breathe the failure. <laughs> if you breathe the failure, you die. <laughs> It was funny. I made this joke. Like, you know, people, you know, <laughs> people who think that restricting your ability to breathe improves your cardiovascular system. I was talking with my friends and I had this joke. I was like, well, let's tell them to go underwater and breathe. And because breathing underwater is hard, it's going to improve the cardiovascular system. It's literally like, it's like that silly, honestly. Okay, let's see. All right, does athletic training nev negatively affect the five to seven day recovery period from strength training? You know, athletic training is a very broad word. Um, it's not really defined. It's, uh, first of all, I mean, athletic training, are, are you referring to like practice, like practicing your sport? I would just call that practice, but athletic training is... Um, for the most part, I hope people are going to get mad. It's for the most part folklore. You know, these um, drills that they do for training outside of practice, like an athletic training center, most of it is, is complete nonsense. Complete nonsense. It's myth, it's folklore. There's no evidence that those, these athletic training facilities, improve the athlete on the field most of the time the improvement the athlete has is from practice um if you're doing you know going to a, like an athletic training center that is going to impact your recovery from strength training now if you're referring to athletic training as practice um it depends on what you do for practice it depends on how long you practice how often a couple you know there's a couple things 
practice, yes. Um, it depends on how long and how often you practice. If you are practicing every single day, um, yes, it's going to impact your recovery. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, one more question, all right, guys? Um, again, if you haven't tried it, goldenerasystem.com. Um, Golden Era Plus, I added a bunch of videos explaining a lot of in-depth concepts. If you want to work with me directly, enjoy my coaching, click the link in the bio. Golden Era System is also in the bio. All right, our incline chest press is good exercise versus normal bench press. Um, they're, they're not to be substituted. You, you know, you don't substitute incline press for a flat press. Um, they're different. Incline press is going to recruit more of the deltoids in the clavicular head of the chest while still involving, you know, the pec major, but um, they're not they're not to be substituted. All right, our cold shower benefits factor cap. Um, my here's the thing. It sounds ridiculous. I'm going with cap. I'm going with fad. Like so here's the thing. Many men, many people want to be better. They want to be more successful. They want to be in better shape. They want to be stronger. They want to be more attra attractive. They want to be better. And many people are under the impression that they're going to be able to find one behave, one little thing that is going to make them significantly better, like a cold shower. Generally, these are young men, young men who might be a little bit insecure, probably aren't where they want to be in life yet. So they're trying all, they're learning, they're trying all these different hacks like cold showers, carnivore diet, blah, 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 thinking that those are the things that are going to make them better. Those are the things that are going to make them smarter, more ambitious, more successful, more attractive, more this, more that. They're not. What is going to make you better is maintaining certain behaviors for a long period of time, being disciplined, and learning from experience. That's what's going to make you better. You know, if you're 21 years old and you're like, hey, I want to, you know, drive a Lamborghini and I want to be 240 pounds shredded and you're not, there's not going to be a handful of silly little things like cold showers and carnivore diet that's going to get you there. What's going to get you there is putting in the work, staying disciplined, dedicated, and consistent and learning from your experience over time. So I, I, I'm thinking that's why the popularity, you know, of all these things. But I'm thinking this cold shower stuff is pretty much nonsense. All right. Anthony Zach, wanted to say your hit training has been amazing. Thank you. Would you even consider doing a video deep dive on the most ideal training routines for boxers? Review pro boxers routines and suggest better. You know, that seems to be extremely popular. So, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of you guys boxing these days, huh? Now, keep in mind, too, you know, if you're a boxer, um, there are trade-offs. You know, your wrists might hurt, your shoulders might hurt, things might start to ache. All right, just remember, you've got to accept that risk with boxing. Boxing is a great skill. It's a great sport. Um, but... It may, you know, it may provide some wear and tear. It may provide wear and tear. All right. Could you return to the old question layout? I don't know what you mean. No, I'm, I'm doing the OBS thing now. It's kind of what I like. Is it tough to see? Because if it is tough to see, I can certainly make it bigger. I can make it bigger. I'm trying to make the live streams look cooler. Um, but yeah, if you want me to do a video unboxing, yeah, I'll do one. Sure. Top three ways to boost testosterone. Eat a healthy, home-cooked diet. Sleep good and avoid alcohol. I mean, top three. Okay. 
Top three. One, eat home. Two, sleep good and avoid alcohol. Avoid alcohol. Avoid alcohol. If you're drinking a lot, your testosterone is going to be destroyed. Strength training. Those are the top three ways. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. I don't want to do TRT even though I'm 37. I just don't want to depend on it for the rest of my life. Well, it depends. I mean, you can, you know, eating a good diet, strength training, sleeping well, avoiding alcohol. These will optimize your testosterone. Will that... May you still be low after that? Maybe. You know, I would try. I would start with that. Um, and if it doesn't get you to the range you want to be, then, you know, maybe TRT is a good good thing. Good approach. All right. What to stop? Okay. One more question. The testosterone stuff's getting popular too. What testosterone level would you recommend TRT? What number? So go back. Guys, if you're interested in testosterone, Google J. Vincent Chris Bronson. Here, let me type the... So he's a friend of mine. Most of his... He's a, he's a medical doctor. Most of his practice is TRT and testosterone. What he does is he doesn't treat testosterone based on the number. He treats the symptoms. So he will start with a dose and adjust the dose until the symptoms are eliminated. Most doctors will say, oh, well, you know, you're at 1,000. Your testosterone is 1,000 or 1,100. It's too high. I'm not giving you any more. Chris Bronson says that's nonsense. He says some people are less sensitive. Some people may need a higher dosage to fix the symptoms, just like regular medicine. So what um, level would I recommend Different levels are beneficial for different people. Some people may have, may have low testosterone side effects and may not alleviate those side effects until they're at 1,400. Some people may have low testosterone and eliminate those side effects at 700. It depends. Depends. I don't drink too much and still make gains on it. Yeah, you'll still make gains on high-intensity training without drinking, but if you're drinking kind of consistently and often... Um, it's going to affect your gains. It's going to affect your gains. All right, guys. Ooh, just hit an hour. All right. Um, that's going to be it for me. Again, goldenairsystem.com if you haven't tried it. If you want to work with me directly and join my coaching program and get annoyed by me every single day as I teach you everything exercise, there's a link in the description for that too. Hit the like if you could. Um, the more likes I get, the more of these I do. A lot of free info here. Um Good way to debunk a bunch of fitness myths and get your questions answered. So also hit the bell notification icon so you can be notified when I do these. I haven't been like, you know, posting them before I launch them. Sometimes I just launch them. So hit the bell notification icon so you know um, when I do them. All right, guys, I'll do another one in a couple days. Stay tuned, like, subscribe, blah, 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 blah. Share this to your friends. If you have people who need to exercise and they're afraid that they have to go six days a week, share this information with them. Okay, you're going to be doing them a huge favor.